Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Lillis, and I work in the Center for Career and Professional Development here at Sacred Heart University. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to welcome everyone to our latest edition of Coffee and Conversations, which is just um, essentially an opportunity for faculty, for career development team, and for some of our recent alum and current students to just kind of gather together um, and discuss topics that we feel are somewhat relevant to kind of what's happening in the world. Um, tonight's event will obviously focus on the pandemic and um, how it has obviously shifted our workplace and hiring. Um, and also, uh, you know, have a discussion regarding the future of human resources management and how, you know, gosh, over the, the last, you know, year or so, obviously the changes that we have um, implemented into our offices and our workplace um, the one, the question is, will that continue and it will be, will it be a hybrid format? Will companies return to the workplace or will there be, you know, a certain component of the workforce that will remain remote? And if they do remain remote, what does that mean for someone in human resources, specifically perhaps, you know, um, a generalist whose, whose sole role is to, um, you know, maintain conversations and dialogue and provide assistance and counsel and support to employees and, um, you know, can that be done successfully? remotely um, and how will companies policies have to shift um, you know with regards to us reopening the world and what might that look like so um, it's my pleasure this evening to uh, to welcome Michael Carriger whom I'm sure all of you on this call um, know well and you've probably um, been lucky enough to and fortunate enough to be in his classes he as you know is the executive director for the Instructional Innovation and, and um, is also the program director for the Masters of Science in, in Strategic Human Resources Management at the university. He earned his Doctor of Management degree from the University of Maryland, University College. He directs efforts at developing and implementing innovative instructional technologies in both in-class and online courses. He teaches graduate courses in a various number of topics in human resources management. His research interests include instructional technology, management education, leadership development, leadership communication, employee engagement, and human resources as, as a strategic business partner. Formerly, he worked as a director of education for a technology learning center. He was an academic a program director for a large university and also human resources and OD consultant for a medium-sized communications company. So thank you, Michael, for being here this evening. Um, we so appreciate your participation, your attendance, and most importantly, your wealth of knowledge that I know you um, will be willing to share with us this evening. And I'm also pleased to introduce um, Akriti Agarwal, who is actually a recent graduate of, um, of our class of 2020. She received her master's in human resources management. Akriti was given the award of excellence by the Southern Connecticut chapter of Shroom. And during her time at Sacred Heart, she was also elected president of the, of the Sacred Heart University chapter of Shroom and revived an almost dormant student chapter facilitating a guest speaker series focused on various aspects of human resources. I can personally attest to what a terrific job um, Akriti did as the president of that, um, of that chapter. It was, it was amazing. Um, the meaningful presentations that she delivered to, um, you know, to her class and prior classes and the discussions that were led um, by herself and her team was, was really remarkable. Um, in December, 2020, um, Akriti joined Simplify VMS as a senior solutions consult consultant. Some of her responsibilities include studying the various capabilities of the vendor management system offered by her company, and hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about this e that this evening, and exploring how, how these can suit the talent management needs of different companies. Prior to entering the graduate program at SHU, Akriti graduated with a degree in counseling psychology and practice as a psychologist in schools, clinical settings and rehabil rehabilitation centers. She also worked as a faculty assistant, organizing lessons and tutoring students, pursuing a master's in psychology. She strongly believes in the idea of lifelong learning, both in personal and professional life. So welcome everyone. Thanks again um, for joining us, us this evening. Um, as I mentioned, this is um, the latest edition of our Coffee and Conversations. Um, roundtable discussions, and most importantly, we're hopeful that this event um, will be as um, engaging, enlightening. Um, we're hopeful that you'll be willing to participate and that it's more of a roundtable discussion and everyone will feel comfortable kind of interjecting and sharing their thoughts um, over the time that we have together this evening. So, um, so I'll just begin. Um, 
Michael and Akriti and I were lucky enough to speak a couple of weeks ago, just um, you know, kind of talking about the pandemic and how it has shifted the workforce. And, and Michael and I had spoken about this brief, briefly before the call this evening. Um, and he had something, he had said something that I thought was really um, somewhat thought provoking with regards to you know defining the pandemic and discussing how it is it has shifted um, the workforce. And he said that um, the pandemic is essentially accelerating change, which is already in place, um, which I thought was kind of quite fascinating and obviously um, very true. So Michael, if you wouldn't mind expanding upon that a little bit, um, I think that would be great. And those of you who are on this call, by all means, please, um, you know, please join us. And, and like I said, it, we'd love it for it to be um, more of a discussion and, and one where you feel comfortable sharing your thoughts and, and questions as well. Sure. The, uh, the thought actually really um, grows out of economics. So, you know, one of the current thinking about economics is that the pandemic isn't actually causing the economy to change, but um, that the pandemic is accelerating changes that were already in place. And so we've been um, thinking about that in, uh, in how applicable that might be in a variety of different areas. And um, I certainly see that in human resources um, and um, also see it in, in education um, as well. So, you know, in, um, in education, there's been a move towards more online teaching and that's been uh, present for, you know, probably the last um, seven to 10 years and obviously accelerating with the pandemic. And then the question becomes, well, after the pandemic is over, do we, you know, go back to 2005 or, you know, does the, you know, landscape in, edu in education, especially higher education continue um, accelerating in this path towards more um, and online education, more diverse um, kind of hybrid approaches to teaching. And I think the same thing is happening in HR. Um, uh, I think a fairly good example of that is that most companies have um, obviously in the during the pandemic had to send their workers home and uh, had uh, their employees working remotely. And what most many companies discovered is that they were still getting work done. Um, and they've also discovered that it's a lot less expensive to have their employees working from home than you know sitting in high rent office space, especially in the larger cities like. New York and Chicago and, and Los Angeles. So, you know, there was a, a movement towards more flexible work schedules and, and more remote work, but it was really accelerated with the pandemic. And then the question becomes, you know, what is it gonna be like after the pandemic? Are these companies gonna have all their employees come back to the office or are they gonna to continue to move employees to, to, more remote, to more remote working? And we're already starting to see that as a trend where companies are not bringing their employees back because they can end up saving quite a bit of money by decreasing their physical footprint uh, and not paying the high rents for office space in the larger cities and just having their employees work from home. Right, um, which for the employee, right? In certain cases, it's, I mean, that that's a tremendous um, privilege and, and certainly probably quite helpful with regards to, you know, work-life balance as well. But the question is, how do you think, um, that shift might affect, you know, the corporate culture because how can that actually fully be defined if you have a certain subset of, of your workforce that's like that's just physically no longer present, um, you know, from just from a day to day interaction, day to day routine, and then you know even with human resources, um, you know, with regards to having someone on the HR team, and as I mentioned before, you know, just simply not having that that human interaction. Um, do Akriti or or Michael or any of anyone else on the call, you know, please jump in. I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, because um, I think that in and of itself is really fascinating. You know, if we fast forward five years from now, how will the cultures of you know some of these very successful firms be either positively or negatively impacted by the fact that there's a percentage of their workforce that just simply isn't on site? Can I, can I have the two cents here? Oh, I have to be honest with you, I'm thinking, um, you know, I think about this all the time and I think when HR, I think some of the questions during interviews will be, you know, you can't say, do you have a child at home? But, you know, do you have a workspace, a private workspace at home? I think those kind of things are gonna become very commonplace um, for a lot of companies that do wanna start going 
um, remote. And my husband and I were just talking about it the other day that New York City has so many empty buildings. Mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, so I think a lot of companies too aren't ready. Like they're just not ready to have their employees not he, you know, not there, not where they can see them and have them and hold them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. But um, I think if big cities like New York City and Boston and, and, and larger cities and these companies start doing it there, I think it will be a big trickle down effect, you know, because space in a lot of buildings is, you know, it, expensive, <laughs> um, prime, you know, prime property, all that stuff. And, you know, if you're not having your client come to your office and you're doing mostly, you know, interaction via zoom or whatever you have sort of web-based, then I think that, um, you know, that, that really also affects the whole, you know, it's one thing having your employees come in, but if your clients aren't coming in either, mm -hmm. You know, I mean that. It, you know, you. I don't know. Now I'm. I'm just starting to drift now. <laughs> right. Well, no. I and I completely agree. I think it's. I really think it's going to be fascinating for us to fast forward five years from now and see right how this pandemic has shifted the workforce. How, you know, as we mentioned, right, companies define their workforce. How, you know, what. Um, parameters they put around, you know, the workforce. And mm -hmm. right, you have businesses like Google who are saying we want all of our, you know, all of our people to be on site on the ground in our offices. Um, you have some of the large investment banks who are saying, you know, we want everyone back, you know, in their places, you know, this summer. Um, you know, Akriti, I'm really interested in hearing, you know, for you from an onboarding perspective, right? So you are, you know, you graduated in the pandemic. Um, you started this wonderful new role in a pandemic. Um, how was onboarding for you? Because I think that in and of itself had been very difficult um, yeah. just to try to make any sort of, um, you know, connections with any colleagues or peers had to have been tremendously hard. Yeah, and uh, you're right. I think when you do talk about company culture, a lot of it comes from what companies are doing to make employees feel like they belong to the company, to create that sense of belongingness. They might not feel it towards their colleagues so much, but at least towards the company itself. You know, do they understand what the mission is? Do they understand what the values is? Because there's no interaction happening at a personal level. And when I joined in December, so I still haven't seen what my office looks like. So I think one benefit of working remotely is that when you're applying for jobs, you're not restricted geographically, right? You could apply for a job on the West Coast because now you don't have that kind of restriction that you only have to apply in your neighborhood. So my office is in New Jersey and it's, it's become a joke that I joined in December, it was peak of winter and every now and then I was, you know, I really wanted to see the office just to look, look at it and see what it looks like because I do know that a part of the workforce was still going. So my manager and I became a joke between us that every time, you know, I told him, okay, I'm gonna come down this Tuesday because it's a two hour commute from where I live that day it would be snowing heavily. So I still haven't seen what it looks like, but you know, to give you an idea of what it feels like, uh, the very unfortunate incident that was in the news, you know, recently this week with the Asian killings and everything, it really impacted me. But I think it also impacted me is because on a normal day, you would go to work, you would have that kind of social space like at the water cooler or at the coffee machine where you would talk to someone about it. And, you know, and it would become a part of your routine. So you know that everyone's aware and you are aware of how they're feeling. So even that lack of connection and having someone to talk about, you know, day-to-day -day things like that and to see what, how they respond and what the company response is to, to an incident like that, you have no idea, right? So I reached out to a colleague of mine and I said, I can't get my head around it. And he was like, you know, why don't you just take the day off? So he made sure I spoke to my manager. He made sure I spoke to a couple of other people in the company. And I think that, you know, says a lot about a company culture that even if we are working remotely, we could be in different parts of the state. So even globally somewhere else, how do you bring people in together? How do you make sure you do encourage those values of diversity and, you know, whatever is a part of your employer branding, not just in your recruitment efforts, but how do you make sure you constantly promote that even virtually? 
especially now I think it's more important because otherwise employees are going to end up feeling more isolated and they're going to be more ignorant about what your company stands for and we don't want that. Um, so interestingly enough, after you had, you know, expressed, you know, your sadness and concern um, to your manager, right? So to your point, if you were on site, you would have just simply walked into the to the human resources generalist's office and sat down and probably felt, you know, significantly better. Again, just having someone to share, you know, your thoughts with um, and and to have that conversation. Um, since you were remote, has was there any outreach from HR um, or you know your manager? Like how? how was that managed, right? Because I'm sorry that you felt that way and it had to have been really difficult, um, you know, to kind of, you know, be upset about an event. And then to your point, you know, not having, um, not having someone physically present, you know, to have a yeah. conversation with, to try to, you know, make yourself feel a little bit better. I did receive an email from the HR the next day saying that we heard, you know, you have to take the day off and hope you're feeling okay. Let us know if you need some time off. And even though the previous day, you know, I kept telling my immediate supervisor that, you know, let me try and focus. And he just made sure that I had everything I needed to take the day off, you know, my meetings and everything were managed and scheduled and postponed or whatever. So I think that understanding was there. But at the same time, uh, you know, what I mean by going to an office space is that you do want to know how your colleagues are responding, you know, to an event like that. If it's affecting me so much, you know, is this something that people want to talk about or is this, you know, just, you know, it's a hush hush topic and it's sort of brushed under the rug. So you do want to get that sense, which you cannot get if you're working remotely, you know, you want to know what your company feels about when it comes to even political events or, you know, even events based on humanitarian grounds, does your company have a stand? on it or not and that sense you get only when you walk you know walk into the office so unless you yourself and you're working remotely reach out to someone you might not get that idea of okay what is my company really representing and i think that gap is something that companies need to take more seriously yeah i mean it, it um you know to your point it specifically speaks to what i just mentioned right the culture right so to your yeah. point not having the ability to know well how is the firm that i've just signed on with um, how, how are they going to react, you know, to certain situations? Um, you know, I lived and worked downtown New York during 9-11, um, you know, and to your point, I will never forget the voicemails. I'll never forget the tremendous amount of support um, that I received. Our offices were closed for an entire week. Um, and this was really before the genesis of any, any technology. So the only way that I had to connect with some of my recruiting team and my manager was through voicemail. And at that point, it was very difficult to get through to anyone in New York, um, you know. But to your point, it was such a difficult time in all of our lives, but yet um, was so reassuring to me because I knew, without a doubt, that I, you know, I was part of a firm that was really special. And to your point, believed everything that I believed in. Um, you know, they were very focused on making sure that their employees were safe and and and. Um, and secure, and obviously, and sadly, a lot of people had lost loved ones and family members, um, you know, but their sole focus was not on the firm in the bottom line, their sole focus was on every single one of us, um, you know, and kind of, you know, wrapping their arms around us, even though we weren't physically together. Um, but I do think, right, that's, that's really important. Um, so add to that, you know, if say it's a company that has offices in Georgia too, are you reaching out to those employees and, you know, mm -hmm. realizing that it might impact them differently, it might impact women differently, it might impact certain communities differently. So do you have that kind of sensitivity and communication in place? Yeah, it's kind of right. Um, it's obviously life altering for so many, but, you know, even for you too, as a, as a young professional, right? So um I'm glad to hear though that they reached out to you and that you had some support. Um, Michael, with regards to um, you know, teaching in your classes, has there been you know, discussion over the last year just with regards, have you, tried, have you needed to kind of pivot and tweak perhaps you know, the content of some of you know, the discussions that you've had with your students you know, now that this world is um, nothing that any of us were prepared for, but we're certainly kind of living and surviving and, and being as resilient as possible? I think um, everybody here has probably heard every story I have to tell. So I don't know if I can tell any more stories that you haven't already heard. Oh, I but, haven't. I'd love to hear um, at least one. 
A couple of things uh, come to mind, especially to Laura's point. Um, the issue of culture is a really interesting one from a different perspective. So, you know, I tell the story in my classes about, you know, when I was working in corporate and I was trying to promote um, as part of my responsibilities in organizational development, trying to, you know, focus on employee engagement and, and promoting work-life balance. And the company was dead set against allowing remote work. So, you know, this was in the, um, you know, mid to mid 2000s. Wait, that, is that right? <laughs> like 2004, 2005, 2000, mm -hmm. you know, through like 2007, 2008. Yes. And um, it's really interesting because if you think about it, like the way I was situated in my office was I sat with my back to the window and my computer in front of me and the door to my office was, you know, in front of my computer. And so, and, you know, I was, you know, the, the company culture was you're sort of judged by how much time you're seen in the office. So a manager could walk by my door and see me sitting at my desk. And if I sat there from eight o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night, I would be like rated as one of the best employees. And for all he knew, I was sitting there playing solitaire the whole time because right. he couldn't see what was on my computer. He just physically saw me there. Yet, if I were working from home, I could be getting much more work done, not playing solitaire and actually getting work done, but I'd be rated as like one of the worst employees because the manager never physically saw me in the building. Right. So to promote this sort of work-life balance and to promote remote work wasn't going to be an effort of getting people to go and work from home. It was going to be an effort of changing the culture of the company. And really what the bottom line was, was or, or at, at heart, what that was, was changing the way in which the company evaluated performance um, and, and what was valuable to the company or, uh, in, in terms of their ability to, to determine whether somebody was doing a good job or not. And so physical presence wasn't the determination of whether you do a good job, it would be actually getting work done, which would mean changing from keeping track of people's hours and are they you know coming in late or are they coming in early? Um, you know, I, I think you all heard this, I tell the story about the, sort of unofficial competition in this company was whose car was the last one in the parking lot at the end of the night. And there were some engineers who would actually kind of fight over it. You know, they would like pretend like they were leaving and then hide in the lobby for a while and hope that the other person left. So theirs was the last car. And, you know, I mean, it's, it sounds really silly, but it's all about like what the company was measuring, at least informally was how much time are you spending in the office had nothing to do with whether you were actually getting anything done. Um, I think um, some of you have probably watched the TED talk that I show oftentimes in my, uh, in the, probably the intro class um, by uh, Jason Fried, who's a venture capitalist. And he talks about, um, you know, different startup companies, companies that he started up and how he, he tries to promote work-life balance and, and um, remote working. And the general argument is that you can't let employees work from home because there's too many distractions at home. You know, there's the TV and there's the refrigerator and they're the kids. And he says that that is actually a myth and it's actually the direct reverse. The thing that interferes with our ability to get work done, he refers to them as the three M's. And for the life of me, I can only remember two of them, but uh, meetings and managers are the two big um, distractions. And his argument is when you, that when you're at work in an office, you very rarely have more than about 15, 20, 30 minutes of uninterrupted time to get work done. And you're then you know, interrupted by an email or you're interrupted by uh, having to go to a meeting or you're interrupted by your manager stopping by your office to ask how you're doing. And he also talks about work as uh, being uh, similar as a, uh, as a process to sleep where um, if you're, you know, remember from your, um, intro to psychology class, the idea of sleep is that you go through these cycles of deeper and deeper sleep. And if you're awakened, you don't go back to sleep at the point you left off. You have to back up uh, through the cycles and then go through the cycles again. And he argues that work is the same way. When we're interrupted, we can't just put aside whatever we're working on and then come back to it and pick up where we left off. We have to kind of back up and say, well, what was I doing? Uh, you know, What were the materials that I needed? And, and then we move forward. So his argument is that we're actually less distracted when we're working at home because the distractions at home, we have control over. We can decide whether we're gonna turn on the TV. We can decide whether we're going to go to the refrigerator. Um, we can decide where we're working, um, you know, whether it be you know, in the living room or whether it be in an office with the door closed or whatever. Whereas when we're at work, we don't have any control over whether our manager comes and asks us whether, you know, how we're doing. And we don't have any control 
over whether we get to go to meetings or not. We have to go to meetings. And most of the time we have to go to meetings, not because we need to be in the meeting. We have to go to meetings because we're covering our ass uh, because if something happens in the meeting and I'm not there, I mean, that's the joke. We talk about this at Sacred Heart all the time. Like the person who doesn't show up to the meeting gets all the action items from the meeting. Um, so, you know, we're just going to make sure right. that we don't miss anything as opposed to like, we actually need to be there. And so, but to get managers to accept that, you know, is, is a change that's going to happen from the top down in terms of the culture. And I think what's interesting about the pandemic is the other thing that we talk about when we talk about change management, I'm not sure that we've talked about this much in class, but when we talk about change management, people are uh, resistant to change and kind of reluctant to change because there's this element of the unknown. It's like, even though things are bad, at least I know they're bad, right? So I'm just going to stick with that. Like things might be better if we made a change, but I don't know. And I don't know what it's going to be like. So I'm just going to uh, sort of be resistant to change. Um, and one of the things we talk about in change management is oftentimes companies will not change until they feel pain. And it's the pain that they feel that pushes them to change. And so I think what's interesting about the pandemic in a very real sense, it was the pain for these companies that are causing the change. And what will be interesting, because the other thing about change that is, is the case is that oftentimes when you implement a change, that change progresses for a while and then employees start uh, backsliding, start falling back to the old way of doing things. And so what's really interesting is, you know, the pandemic has caused us to change the way we do business. And the question is, once the pandemic is over, are we going to start backsliding back to the old ways? Um, and, you know, one of the sort of hallmarks of change management is the best way to stop that backsliding is to take away the old way. So for example, if we used to use one kind of form and now we're using an electronic system instead of a paper form, the best way to keep us from backsliding back to the paper form is to get rid of all the paper forms. So we can't backslide. We have to keep using the, the new system, the electronic system. And so, you know, all these companies have sent all their workers home as, as, as you know, they were motivated to do that because of the pain of the pandemic. And then the question is like, after the pandemic's over, are they going to not feel the pain anymore? And so they're going to start, you know, having employees, you know, return to the office, or is that pain going to be kind of ongoing in a way in terms of, you know, the realization that, oh, I don't have to pay so much high uh, expensive rent for office space. So we'll keep the workers from home. That's almost like taking away the, the um, old way of doing it, right? Like, I'm just going to, cancel my rent, you know, my contracts on all my office space or some portion of my office space because it's so expensive. And so that actually takes away that ability then to slide back to let's go back to the way we, you know, we're, we're used to be doing, we used to do things. And it's interesting because we're struggling with that at Sacred Heart right now. Um, you know, I don't, um, you know, I think all, all of you get the coronavirus task force emails. I think students get those. Yes. And, the last one that came out, uh, not today, because that was a that was the, a bad one. But the one last week was like, there will be no more shoe flex come fall, and um, that just kills me from the um, you know directing the Center for Excellence, Innovation, and Teaching because essentially what that's saying is you can go back to the way things were like in 2019, so or, you know 2018 or whatever. Like everything that we learned through the pain of going through the pandemic could just easily just be pushed aside and let's just go back to the way it was before. Um, and so, you know, we're sort of struggling with that at Sacred Heart too. Like how do we manage the change that was motivated by this pain that we were experiencing and how do we make sure that change keeps going? I mean, obviously there were some parts of shoe flex that didn't work very well. And so we wanna do something about that, but there were also a lot of things we learned about teaching through the pandemic and using shoe flex um, and as, all of you guys know we were doing shoe flex before there was shoe flex, right? Because we were doing it in the fall of 2019 before, before the pandemic. But we learned a lot about, um, you know, one of the things we learned that, um, that didn't work so well was the uh, live streaming from the classroom. And so switching from having like students in the classroom as well as students at home and then live streaming and trying to coordinate all of that, we sort of switched to just doing all our classes over Zoom. And you guys are probably sick of that already, but you know, you're mm -hmm. kind of used to that and you saw how we did that. And, and, you know, so, you know, what's going to happen in the fall, what's going to happen next spring? Are we just going to go back to everything being on ground and no, you know, and, and no live, no flexibility. I mean, I think most of you really appreciated the flexibility 
of you know, being able to log into class, not coming to class, watching the recording, uh, physically coming to class or virtually coming to class, those kinds of things. Um, so, um, you know, in a, in a, in a way from the uh, change management perspective, the pandemic was like this pain that led to or motivated the change. And then the question is, is that change going to continue or is it going to start falling back? And, um, one of the other things that Laura, Laura said that I thought was really interesting is if you look at the, um, if you look at the literature on remote working, there are two things you should do if you're working from home. One is set a space in your home to work from that is different from where you live. So for example, I'm violating that right now because I'm sitting at my desk, which is right in my living room, but um, I should have a separate space in my house where I work. And then I go to that space to work. And then when I'm done working, I leave that space and go back to the part of the house where I live. And the idea behind that is if we don't do that, we end up being like connected 24 seven and we're just like constantly working. And that's actually one of the um, negative consequences of the pandemic is everybody's working from home and all of a sudden they've got their phone next to them all day and all night and they're constantly, you know, accepting emails, checking emails and uh, where they have their laptop open and they're constantly working. And then by setting aside a separate space to work in, you can close your laptop, you can leave your mm -hmm. digital device or your cell phone or whatever, um, you know, where your laptop is and go to another part of the house. And you can actually, it's almost like going home from work. And then the second thing the literature says is that you get dressed to go to work, even if you're at home. So how many of you are sitting there in sweatpants right now that we can't see because it's all below the Zoom screen, right? <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to actually put real work clothes on right. and go to your workspace in your house and work. And it's the same kind of thing. It's where, you know, okay, this is what I do. You know, I'm working now on, in, under these, um, you know, relatively constrained, you know, time constraints from this time to that time or whatever, roughly I'm working. And when I'm not working, I'm not working. And what happens is when we go to work remotely in our pajamas and, you know, wearing sweatpants and a sweatshirt, and we have our laptop on our lap, you know, in the living room, we just never turn off. And then we end up working 24 seven essentially and, and burning out very quickly. Um, so there are things that, um, so, you know, that kind of goes back to the original thing I was saying is like, all of these things have been like floating around for, you know, some number of years, um, but they've been, you know, kind of here and there sort of spotty. Some companies are doing some remote work you know, some research is done on like, how do you do remote work effectively? Uh, but it was really the pandemic that kind of accelerated all of that. And the interesting question from a change management standpoint, from an HR standpoint is, you know, are we going to backslide or are we going to take what we learned through this pandemic and move forward? Um, you know, is that change that is accelerating going to continue to accelerate or is it going to slow down or maybe even reverse? Right. So it's kind yeah. of an exciting time to to be in HR, actually. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so in terms of, you know, remote work, everything's virtual now. Um, I know over the past year, I've seen like countries and other states kind of throw out specifically Bermuda um, that you can, you know, work and live down in Bermuda for like a full year um, due to COVID and whatnot. Um, and I know there's a lot of people out there that are interested, it's like, oh, I can work from home now, everything's virtual. Um, so that means instead of paying an enormous rent to live in like San Francisco, I can move down to Texas where it's cheaper or move to another country. Uh, and I know, you know, companies can run into um, some tax problems there um, if they're not living and working uh, within the same state that they're employed. Um, I just wanted to know what some of your thoughts are in terms of HR and how you manage that. Well, it, um, so a, a lot of companies had, some companies had to deal with this even before, you know, sending all their workers home remotely. So for example, before I came to Sacred Heart, I was working at Gettysburg. I was a visiting professor at Gettysburg College, but I was living in Maryland. So, you know, Gettysburg is probably 10 minutes over the Maryland, Pennsylvania border. So their HR, department, especially payroll, had to be pretty well versed in how to manage like tax issues, right? So um, they, you know, I was getting paid, but, ta uh, but the, they would have to pay, they would take my tax contribution and they would pay it to Maryland, 
rather than paying it to Pennsylvania because you're taxed where you live, you're not taxed where you're working. So some companies, you know, have had to deal with that, but now a lot more are having to. And the, the way I look at it is the changes that are kind of accelerating with remote work and, and um, you know, other sort of issues that sort of revolve around that. I mean, I tend to um, not think of these things as like impossible, right? That they're, they're just, they're challenges that HR is gonna have to deal with. Um, you know, to Akriti's point about um, uh, onboarding, I mean, we are dealing with that today. We hired three instructional designers in August. They've never, they, I think all three of them have been, each of the three of them have been in the office once. Um, and it's been a real struggle for them um, because a lot of the work that they're doing is interacting with faculty. And so I'll, I'll, some of it is sort of based on relationships that they build with faculty in terms of trying to get faculty to do things that they might not be comfortable doing or otherwise would do, you know, in terms of how they're teaching and how they design their courses. And it's been a real struggle for them because they're not able to form those kinds of relationships. So that to me, that doesn't mean don't have remote work then, right? To me, that means we have to be creative as HR professionals to figure out, well, okay, given the environment, how do we onboard people um, in a remote setting like this? And I, I'll be the first one to admit that we did a lousy job with these three instructional designers. Um, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would, you know, think more seriously about like, what is the kernel at the core of onboarding? What is it that you're trying to accomplish with onboarding? And then how can you accomplish that virtually? Um, that, uh, you know, because you have, you know, people working remotely or whatever. And then that could then become the sort of beginning of an onboarding process that would end up being a better onboarding process, not just for remote workers, but for, um, you know, workers on site as well. So I don't think that these things are like obstacles that can't be overcome. I think they're obstacles that require HR to be creative. Um, to overcome. And that's why I think this is a really interesting time to be in HR. I mean, it's challenging, but I think it's really interesting. There are real opportunities to do um, some cutting edge things that, um, you know, you, you wouldn't have done in HR, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So, Akriti. Um, and, and I want to know what this company is in Bermuda because I want to go and live in Bermuda <laughs> for a year and work. <laughs> right. No, I mean, charming. I was enticed to. Oh, she's muted. Um... No, the other, um, you know, thought I had too was it'll be really interesting to see how, you know, corporations welcome their employees back and also um, to what extent they are, you know, somewhat mindful of ensuring that their employees are vaccinated. Um, yeah. There was an article in the journal yesterday about, you know, can, you know, and you hear, you know, you hear people in the supermarket having this conversation, you know, can, can employers essentially require their employees to be vaccinated prior to the you know return to the office, um, and the answer is yes. The answer is yes, but then you know, but then it gets there's a little nuance in that um, you know if if an employee declines to be vaccinated for a medical or religious reason, obviously that you know those reasons can't be um, they can't be investigated, and, they, and you can't necessarily ask questions as to why. Um, but I think that you know moving forward too, as far as like how the workplace is going to adjust to that and specifically human resources, because obviously those issues, you know, um, kind of fall squarely within, you know, within their world, um, you know, of simply managing that. I mean, obviously private institutions, probably they have a little bit more leeway, but, um, you know, some of these publicly owned companies, you know, how, how will they manage? Um, you know, I mean, I know at Sacred Heart, we have to upload our vaccination cards once they're received, just so they can get a sense of how many employees have been vaccinated. It'd be interesting to see though, you know, when students are in, when students are invited back to campus, you know, what the policy is when, you know, all the Google employees return, you know, back to their offices, what the, what the policy will be. Um, when we all start to travel again, you know, will there be vaccine passports and, you know, how will the, how will the airports? And I know there have been, you know, discussions about airlines, you know, more or less, you know, requesting that. I mean, obviously we're not at that point yet where we have, you know, we haven't obviously reached, um, you know, any super high percentage of, of we have, we have, but not to the extent that we need to, I should say, um, you know, or we certainly haven't reached herd immunity yet. And the question is, well, how will we know when we reach that, right? Because so much of this is unknown. So um, for those of you on the call, I'm just really interested, are you 
wanting to move into employee relations, um, the generalists recruiting, because obviously there's so many different aspects of human resources that will be and have been and will continue to be, you know, affected. I know Akriti last time we spoke was talking about, you know, just the skills that, and actually it was fascinating because I showed a presentation last night to a marketing class about um, how to prepare for an interview and, you know, what skills employers valued in the workplace. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, right, it was team orientation, it was leadership, it was creativity. You know, now Akriti um, had shared with us during our last conversation, you know, now it's adaptability, it's self-motivation, it's resilience, it's digital fluency, right? It's all of these new keywords that we all know um, have are tremendously needed in order for an employee to be successful. Um, but it, that in and of itself will be interesting to see, right, to Michael's point, you know, then how will be how will employees be evaluated, right? And and the concern is no more about, is no longer about optics. And Michael, I, I lived in those days where optics was very important. Um, you know, now it's gonna be productivity and it's going to be self-motivation. It's gonna be resiliency. And obviously for all of you, it's a super exciting time because you're just about to enter this world and it's going to be, um, you know, how can you, to Michael's point, right, look through this new prism, which is is um, filled with change, and obviously, right, change in chaos, right, essentially breeds opportunity. Um, but I'm curious, from your perspective, Jenny and Laura, if you feel comfortable sharing, um, you know, just how you are perhaps, you know, kind of redefining your role in Accredi too, because you're really, gosh, essentially living it. You were a student in the pandemic, you're a new hire in the pandemic, and now you're going to be, you know, a professional within the world of human resources, essentially in a pandemic and, and moving out of it and shifting it and shifting um, focus and, and what do you all think that might look like? So I'm actually, I'm looking at it um, as I'm entering the field. So um, after I graduate, I'm going to be applying for positions. Um, and, and just uh, during my search for internships, I noticed that you know, with the option of remote work, we're sort of dissolving the geographical boundaries that kind of maybe once held us, you know, whether it's in state or in the tri-state area. Now we have opportunities to apply to positions all over the country, essentially. Um, but I also can't help but think about the other side of that in that now organizations have in, an entire nation or an entire world of candidates that are at their access. Um, so I guess I'm I'm sort of curious as to as to what you all think. You know, is it, you know, from from an organizational standpoint, is the remote work actually a benefit to them in sort of their search for talent, or is does it make it more difficult for organizations to retain their talent since, um, you know, now an applicant can apply to organizations anywhere in the world. And um, that's a fascinating thought too, um, Jenny. In right, I remember, and Michael, you probably recall too. You were always when you were working on site, and to your point, Jenny, about you know, kind of um, moving on to another firm. If you're working remotely, there's no concern. If you're not in the office, you're not in the office. And if you're, you know, unavailable for a certain amount of time, nobody essentially knows what you're doing. Um, so it will be interesting from a retention perspective to see, um, you know, how the pandemic kind of shifts um, hiring for sure, um, and and development. You know, obviously, to Akriti's earlier point about you know, not necessarily having that human connection, and are the companies that right have kind of embraced this change and have been able to successfully introduce some way of you know, providing virtual support for their employees, how will that be, you know, how will that be valued by, you know, new hires or prospective hires like yourself? So um, two points come to mind. Uh, one to your point, uh, Shaila, is that, uh, you know, I recently spoke to someone who went for an actual in-person interview. I'm not sure if I shared this story with you. But, you know, she was talking about how she's used to, she's been giving virtual interviews for so long. And uh, she finally stumbled upon this, you know, opportunity where she was actually called for the final round of interview, which was in person. And she said, I, I just 
free talk a lot and I couldn't, you know, I got tongue tied and I couldn't say a word because I'm so not used to giving an interview in person where I know that the interviewer can assess my body language and my non-mobile communication and it's just a lot of information and I'm not sure if I'm dressed properly and, you know, if my expressions are correct. So she said I could reflect on that after coming back, but I think that the interviewer was, you know, more conscious of the fact that she is not very comfortable giving an in-person interview and that was taken into consideration. And similarly for existing employees, right? Not just from an organizational point of view, what policies we need to have and do we, you know, make it mandatory for people to be vaccinated. But I think I'm just curious to see that even if we are vaccinated, how comfortable do we feel, you know, sharing a workspace or how comfortable do we feel uh, being in a meeting room with 40 people or shaking hands with someone. So, you know, we've been living in an isolated six feet distance for so long that even bringing employees back has to be a very conscious decision on part of organizations. They cannot go back to the same physical work structures that they had in place earlier if they do want employees to come back. So that is something I think they need to consider. And the second point, uh, you know, is that the only way I think that some of these challenges can be managed is again through technology, right? So I know that a lot of companies have changed their drug and screening processes. I know a lot of the GDPR and tax issues and employment laws, all of that has been automated because now they have candidates applying from different geographical areas and they don't want to, you know, if the job is open for remote work, then they don't want the specific state to be any specific state to be given a preference over other states. So they have to make sure they have a system in place. If suddenly there's a candidate who's hired from Connecticut for an office in New Jersey. So also, and I remember in our HR program, we used to discuss this, that the more we automate some of these processes, the more HR can focus on the strategic piece of it. Um, you know, recently I was speaking to uh, this person called Steve Todd and, you know, feel free to connect with him. He's a great guy. He works at NASDAQ as uh, I think he is ahead of the workspace uh, program management system over there. So he was telling me how it's been so challenging because he basically, you know, looks at real estate and, you know, what offices and how to design workspaces for employees. And he said that, you know, it's not just us, but it's it's when we reach out to employees, they don't know what they're looking for. They are not sure if they want to come back. They're not sure what kind of a work system they want. They, they're not sure how many other employees on the floor they'll be comfortable with. So it's going to be a lot of trial and error and we need to have a backup plan ready in case it doesn't work out because it's not just about our preference in terms of having these specific positions, these specific employees of this department on site it also you also have to make sure that these employees feel comfortable coming back and the physical office environment is different from what it was earlier and it's sort of a mix between working from home and the physical office space so i thought that was really interesting because i don't i'm not sure if a lot if you know companies are putting a lot of thought into it and that's where the hr is definitely going to play an important role yeah, gosh, I mean, no doubt, um, all of you on this call and your and your you know your classmates, um, you know, as well as as well as Michael um, and myself too, right? It's it's a tremendous privilege to a certain extent, um, you know, to be kind of living through this very um, critical time in our nation's history for a multitude of reasons, um, and you know, but yet probably now more than ever, um, you know, the impact that all of you can have, um, you know, on the change that that is imparted on this world, you know, I hope is one that all of you embrace because it's it's pretty special. Um, and I do think if nothing else, it has, you know, hopefully allowed us all to kind of be a little bit more reflective. Um, and then to Michael's point, you know, determine, okay, well, this change is happening and how are we going to channel it and perhaps you know, what lessons have we learned, right? I mean, my gosh, I'm sure all of us can point to a multitude of silver linings um, that we've all found, right, throughout the pain of this pandemic. And the hope is that, um, you know, once we come out the other side, you know, no different than, you know, other events that have that have happened in, in our history, whether it's, you know, industry related or, um, you know, specific to a certain area or, or geography or if it's, um, you know, specifically industry related and whatnot, um, it'll be really fascinating to see. 
um, right? I wish, I hope that maybe in five years, all of us can get back together and we can film a sequel to this discussion and we'll certainly have lots to, lots to discuss. Um, but it's really, you know, obviously fascinating. It's an ongoing, certainly an ongoing challenge and, and conversation, you know, that all of you will have. And um, it's really wonderful that all of you have had the ability and, and the gift of, you know, attaining a higher degree within this world, um, because you're essentially the change leaders. And, um, you know, to have the education and be educated, like, you know, folks like Michael is really, um, is really terrific. And, you know, I hope you all realize, um, you know, the, the impact and the influence that you can have in this world. That's the one thing that I always talk to our students about when they're creating their resumes, you know, to be specifically focused, you know, not necessarily on what you did on a day-to-day -day basis, but the impact and the influence that you had. Um, you know, and I think just taking the time to get an advanced degree in this, um, you know, in this discipline will allow all of you to look at things, you know, very differently, um, you know, from a very different platform and, and foundation. And, you know, hopefully you will all be the gift, um, you know, to to your future employer or your existing employers and, you know, in the way that that you see, you know, this pandemic and most importantly, how, you know, how they can essentially pivot, you know, to Michael's point earlier, um, you know, learn, right? Learn from all the pain and learn from all the challenges. And hopefully we all come out, um, you know, come out the other side. So does anybody have any questions or, or any um, final thoughts that they would love to share with us? I just want to say um, to Dr. Carriger's point, um, when you were stating that, are we going to slide back? I really think a lot of company, and like we had said, the bottom dollar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what Will going back to offices versus staying home? Will the bottom what what will the bottom dollar be? Right. So it it does it costs too much to um, rent a building in Fifth Avenue. So therefore, we're going to keep this remote going. But it, you were saying about the students at Sacred Heart, um, it'll also come down to the bottom dollar because if they don't have any more flex, if they're not going to offer the flex um, shoe flex, then some students might decide another school. Um, might be more, um, you know, fit their needs. And then that's what's going to affect the bottom dollar. That's gonna affect the slip back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it most certainly is. I mean, gosh, it's going to be really fascinating and really interesting, um, you know, to see. And like I said, as difficult as this time has been, um, is as exhilarating as this time has been, just with the tremendous amount of change this country has gone through, um, obviously, human resources management, you know, that the discipline in and of itself has gone through this, the changes the in industries have gone through, um, you know, employment rates. Um, it's really, it's really kind of wild. Um, this one chapter in the history book that, that we're all living through and there's, you know, so many events, it's not just specifically the pandemic, there's, you know, so many other events that we're all, um, you know, living through and a part of, but like I said, I, ho I hope that throughout all of it, everyone feels kind of um, you know, emboldened to continue to impact change and to have their voices heard and, um, you know, to, to make sure that companies and organizations and ones that all of you join, you know, have, have the ability to learn from this and, and to embrace the change and, you know, not be frightened by it, um, you know, and perhaps make sure that the lessons that we have learned that are, you know, are then, are then applied um, to the workforce, but it really, gosh, I'd love to fast forward and see the sequel to this presentation, to, to this discussion, because I think it would be super fascinating. Um, and maybe we could all make a date to do that the next five years to come back here five years <laughs> from now and talk about, you know, how, how the pandemic has truly shifted the workforce, because it's going to be wild to see the perspective that we all have. Um, yeah, I would love that. <laughs> right. Um, well, gosh, I'm so thankful for all of you for um, for joining us this evening. Um, I hope you found it as as um, enjoyable as I did. And um, you know, thank you to Michael and to Akriti for joining us, and Alexander for doing such a terrific job with the Shroom chapter at SHU. Um, you've held some wonderful events, and Jenny and Laura, thanks so much for your time for logging on to yet another Zoom session. Right? Hopefully, maybe this time next year we'll be in person holding something like this. Um, but I'm thankful and um, I wish all of you the best of luck. And of course, if I can be of any help, 
Um, we are in the office, the Center for Career and Professional Development. We are um, on site, on ground. Um, I'm over on West Campus, but my colleagues are all on East Campus in um, McMahon Common. So please don't be a stranger. And, you know, of course, if you need us, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Okay. All right, everyone. Thanks so much again for joining us. I'm really, really grateful. Yeah. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. And Michael and Akriti, my sincere thanks. Thank you, Sheila. All right, everyone. Thank Have you. a great night. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Stay well.